Welcome to Almost Here, Round the Corner of Future Technology podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies poised to transform our lives for better or worse are the focus of this podcast. Almost Here means these technologies are now here and starting to be used or just around the corner from Bitcoin to artificial intelligence, 3D printing, blockchain, virtual reality, and more. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Tech Podcast. My guest today is Mark Stephen Meadows. Um, he created a venture called Seed, uh, it's a blockchain-based venture. And in part of that venture is a company called Botanic, which we'll start to talk about, then we'll talk about Seed, a little bit of a complicated interaction between the two, which Mark will explain. But uh, these are the two ventures we'll be talking about. And Mark is the CEO of a San Francisco-based, again, Botanic, Technologies. They build CUIs for large corporations and governments. Um, so, without any more details, with, with uh, me making it complicated, Mark, how are you doing? I'm doing good. It's thanks. Thanks for having me on today. It's, it's yeah. I'll ask you about your background in a minute. But can you um, let's talk about the two ventures, Seed and then Botanic. How are they related? And then listeners will have an understanding of where we're going to go from here. Yeah. Um, you know, Botanic provides the tools to our customers to deploy trusted bots and. And the bots are multimodal, so they have faces and they have voices. And just like you might talk with somebody over Skype, you can talk with these bots. And over the last several years, since 2011, we noticed more and more problems within artificial intelligence and and problems with and so we realized that we need to start a whole economy that allowed an open source independent market for developers so that they could build these bots and we tied that to the blockchain. So Botanic builds bots and we're a founding partner of Seed, which is this marketplace for those bots and bot components. Okay. So you, hmm, so you create bots that uh, people can interact with and they can see and they can chat with and they're more than just chat bots or are they chat bots that just have a face on them or an image? Well, yeah, they're, they're more than just chatbots, really. I mean, um, my own background, I, I got out here to San Francisco around 93 and helped develop well.com, third.com website. And I started a VR company from 1995 to 98. We were building avatars and, and, and some of, as far as I know, the very first multi-user 3D environments. Um, I went on wow. to work at Xerox Park, Stanford Research Institute, the VAH out in uh, Holland and, and uh, and then had an AI company from 2005 to 2008. Um, and then it was 2001 that I built my first chatbot. Uh, it was pretty simple stuff. I mean, back then, and it's still, I think, very simple in terms of what happened was I basically was trying to connect the virtual reality work I had done with a lot of this chatbot kind of AI and natural language processing work. Uh, how do you take an avatar in something like Second Life for a video game and rig that thing up so that it can answer questions like, you know, where is the princess that I'm supposed to rescue? And then that, that non-player character or robot in the game can then provide a backstory or a narrative. So we started building these characters around 2011 at Botanic, in some cases for games, uh, in other cases for mobility or healthcare. Um, and over the years, we found that, you know, when you take a basic chatbot, and you add voice to it, you get something like an assistant, like Alexa or Siri or Cortana. But the right. human limbic system hasn't really evolved in the last 50,000 years. And so we actually also, you know, what you and I are doing right now is very strange. I can't see your face. And, and we're used to, as humans, historically speaking, communicating multimodally, where we can use body mm. language and gestures and expressions, as well as tone of voice, to communicate. So chatbots are really a very early primitive initiation uh, of, of what artificial intelligence is. And we see the voice and the face and that multimodal expression as being an important evolution of what artificial intelligence is and where it's headed. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it makes sense. I understand what you mean now by multimodal. But yeah, I mean, just one, one example is that if I, you know, if I say, I love public speaking, that's a lot different than if I say, I love public speaking. And that prosody and that tone of voice adds a whole other layer of meaning to it. And so these systems like Alexa, Siri, are there to really record these multiple layers of information as we talk so they can better understand us, right? Yeah, it's funny. Whenever I've heard people talk about chatbots, all they seem to talk about is uh, making sure that it beats the Turing test or, uh, you know, the chatbot can answer people's questions. But there's none of this other stuff that you're talking about, the intonation, um, you know, looking at a face. 
body language, any of that stuff. So it makes sense that that's missing and it's important. Yeah, it's it's tricky, and uh, a lot of it requires some pretty heavy duty libraries to develop. Um, we did uh, several different deployments on Skype with Microsoft, and you know there we were using Microsoft's cognitive services. And so we basically multiplex these things. We like just sort of drive them all together. Think of it like an orchestra, really, where the computer vision, so the system's able to see your face, that's like the oboes. And the automated speech recognition is able to recognize your voice. That's sort of like the trumpets. And then you have the chat bot itself and the natural language processing the phone. That's like the drums. And all of these different instruments get played together when you have a multimodal bot or, you know, what's called a video bot. Um, cause you know, there's like this chat bots and assistants and video bots and AR and VR bots. We call them bots in general, but when you have this orchestra of these different AI systems working together, then you really end up with a much richer experience. And you can also use this cool thing called the graphical user interface, which, you know, hasn't really gone away despite the fact that, you know, these are conversational interfaces, we can still use graphics. And so that avatar that's there, the face of the AI is a very important part of the graphical user interface of that conversational system. So there's a lot, there's a lot to it, and, and we see a, a lot of different potential use cases down the road. Well, how about now? Where are the bots being used? And, um, you know, what are users saying if you're at that point? How's their experience with the bots versus traditional ones? Yeah, I mean, um, generally speaking, people are more likely to trust a system that has a face and has a voice. And part of that just has to do with, as I mentioned, the way that humans have evolved uh, over the, the millennia. Um, and in some cases, we found some strangely positive results, such as for health and wellness. We've done maybe five or six builds here. Um, people are more likely to share their information with a bot than they are with a person. And at first, that seems kind of weird. Um, but in fact, most people don't want to they, they don't they don't feel judged by a bot and they also don't want to be embarrassed so if it's if it's a, a health and wellness use case uh that seems to work really well and we, we need a lot more information about the end user and therefore make better uh recommendations on what the person should be doing the weird things that start to creep in because most people are more likely to do what the bot tells them to do again in that healthcare use case than they would if it was a human doctor. And that's because people believe that the bot is, well, because it's AI, it's somehow objectively true. Um, but so there's this weird dynamic where in that, again, health and wellness use case, the end user provides more information about themselves and they do what the bot tells them to do more than if it were a person. And that introduces a really curious power dynamic. Um, now, we can get back to that later. That's part of the reason why we got seed going. But um, we've also found that in customer relations management and a lot of help desk, something like 40% of the work is uh, offloaded to bots. Um, that's that's really easy. You know, a lot of these people that are working at help desks are just being roboticized. And so we look at it as really a way to help people not act like robots at work. Um, and then, you know, some other stats, we're looking at, you know, something like a three to four time growth curve uh, between now and 2021 according to uh, Gartner and others that, that just show that this market is really being exploding. Because I mean, it's artificial intelligence in terms of how we converse with these systems. So, um, you know, there's a lot of jobs that will be displaced and affected by this, and there'll be a lot of money that will be both saved and earned. Um, so we're at the very beginning of this industry, for sure. Well, how do you um, <clears throat> stay away from the uncanny valley? You know, if your bot, if you can see the bot and it has expression, intonation, and, you know, it looks somewhat human uh do you run into problems where people are just are disgusted by them and don't like them yeah i'm so glad you asked this rich it's, it's awesome because that is probably the single most important design concern that we've had at botanic and the, and it will continue to be a problem in the coming years you know the uncanny valley i think it was masahiro mori used this term in robotics to explain as you clearly know uh you know as a robot approaches human likeness it's completely believable up until it starts to look realistic. And then some part of our brain says, oh, it's a sick person or, oh, it's a zombie. Um, and that's not just in the appearance of it, but also in the movement. And we found that there's also a, like this kind of pockmarked landscape of uncanny valleys where there's not only the appearance, but also the sound of the voice. 
And then there's also questions around the timing and there's also psychological uncanny valleys and ways that as humans we're, we're accustomed to interacting. And so the bots, as, as we've developed them at Botanic over the years, we've really worked very closely with artists and musicians and award-winning poets and authors. And oh, of course we have, you know, a stack of these you know, silver-backed engineers that are really able to, to manage this stuff. But there has to be an art that really considers it. So in short, to try to answer your question, at Botanic, we've generally moved towards making cartoon looking characters. Uh, characters that the, there's an outline and you can see that it is clearly not a person though it has a face and it smiles and it can see you, uh, you know, with these eyes on the screen. But we really try to avoid that uncanny valley by just not trying to even make the thing look like a person. There's enough humans already out there, right? You know, so, hmm. so basically that's also, it's been interesting too, because if you look at uh, the work at Pixar, they take the recording of someone like Jack Black and then they put the cartoon character, the panda on it. And that's completely believable. Um, one time we did a project in conjunction uh, with the Chinese healthcare authority and they insisted on having a photorealistic face, but we had a robotic sounding voice and it just rubbed the fur in the wrong direction. It, it was like this really extremely uncanny experience. So we spend a lot of our time and we try to navigate around that. Um, yeah, it's, it's real art. Interesting. Okay. How did you come so, across the Uncanny Valley? I mean, how 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 do you know about this? I'm surprised that someone in blockchain would be familiar with that. Uh, you know, I've seen articles that talk about it. I mean, I've seen examples of some of the, uh, you know, usually it's always in Japan. They always seem to be pushing the boundaries of what's spooky and what's not. So I saw like a robot, I think it was from Japan or something, and it, it did look weird. It didn't, it, something was wrong, you know, when you looked at it. It didn't, uh, it just didn't feel right, you know. So that that was my experience with it. It was just very odd. But I understand. Yeah, you know, I got a gut feeling for what that that means. It means you like creeped out by something. It's just something wrong that it tells your brain that. Yeah, yeah. There's a guy named. I, I wrote a book called We Robot. A lot of work we're doing here really is software robotics. But there's a guy named Hiroshi Ishiguru, and Ishiguru has spent the last decade or so making these androids that look like him or that look like his daughter or his wife, and. And they are uh, profoundly uncanny. And, and when I met the guy, uh, I first met his robot before him. And so um, <laughs> I could, I walked into the room and there's this thing, you know, I thought it was him. And I thought, I've got something wrong with his hair. And then it lifted up its head and looked at me and it really gave me a fright. Um, but then sure. I had to do a second take because I was like, Wait, is this him and he's sick? <laughs> it was kind of funny, but uh, no, it's it's a it's a real thing for sure, and it's definitely an important part of the user experience. And, um, yeah, so it's uh, it's it's a That's whole crazy. weird new world. Are, are, have you heard of Google Duplex? Uh, no, I've just heard the term, but I don't know anything about it. Yeah, you might want to check this out also because here, I mean, they really, uh, in terms of that audio component of the Uncanny Valley, they really built. They're demonstrating systems that uh, sound exactly uh, like a person uh, with these kinds of moments where you're um, ah, ing as the system is talking, uh, what are called disfluencies. And the system is so believable that while it is in, in demonstrations, just, you know, you can look up Google Duplex demo, you can hear the person that's talking with that system completely presuming that it's a person. And so when we have this uh, capability, which we now do have both in terms of the visuals and in terms of the audios, to get to a point at which you can't tell if the system is a real person or not, you again enter into this ethical territory where you don't necessarily know whether you can trust that system as a person. You don't know who's connected to it and what it's actually doing. Um, and true, so, yeah. you know, these, this, Duplicitous, potentially duplicitous behavior is something that we need to be very cautious of. And over the years, we've really, um, you know, uh, we have both patented and, and deployed bots that are authenticated because we believe that these things need to have license plates. And if we're trusting them with our health and with our finances or education or even just like, you know, base business, they need to have a license plate. And so authenticating bots sure. to help kind of address what is a quickly diminishing uncanny valley um, is really an important important part. You know, give give these things license plates. Well, I'm talking about the license plates. Tell me about seed and how all this relates to botanic. Yeah, 
I mean, um, you know, the, there were, I guess, these two ethical issues I, I brought up, you know, one about that kind of power, uh, the power relationship between a healthcare bot, um, and then also this ability for a bot to be duplicitous, um, really caused us to begin to realize that there are three primary problems that artificial intelligence is presenting. Uh, one, we have the displacement of jobs, and a lot of people are going to lose work, and there'll be other jobs that will be created. Uh, second is we're going to see real questions around how do we manage our own private data? Um, how do we keep track of our own identity and control the decisions we're making? And then at a larger level, also, we're looking at artificial intelligence as, as an emerging form of government. We can see that in China right now, with a national uh, identity reputation, that uh, governments are now able to use artificial intelligence. And so we thought maybe what we should be doing, because bots are hard to build, and because we have these ethical questions in front of us, we make a system that is completely transparent, completely open source, allows people to trust the code that's there, allows them to authenticate bots. And so essentially, Seed is an open, independent, it's, it's a marketplace for developers and the users of the bots to ultimately democratize artificial intelligence. We, we need to democratize artificial intelligence just because we see a lot of things that, that could go wrong if we, if we don't. Well, what are some of the examples of what could go wrong with bots that are unregistered? I mean, you know, maybe it's obvious, but tell me what you think. Yeah. Um, you know, we've had a couple of, uh, have two uh, large hotel chains that uh, approached us and said, we deployed bots on Facebook, um, but the bots weren't authenticated. And what it meant was that the uh, there's there were man-in-the-middle attacks that had been performed, and people were able to use those bots to collect uh, the credit card information of folks that were trying to book hotel rooms. And it also really did some damage to those hotel brands as well, um, where the bot was uh, able, <laughs> because it wasn't authenticated, it was saying things that the hotel chain didn't want it to say. Um, and so well, that's like, really bad. Really, I mean, it could, it could get the hotel into a lot of liability, I could see. Yeah, yeah. And, I mean, you know, you have a Facebook account, right? Right. I don't really use it, but I have one that... Yeah, well, you're you're authenticated on Facebook. I'm authenticated on Facebook, but bots don't need to be, and that is really a strange thing because bots can spam and spam and fish and spoof faster than a human can, and so all of the kinds of you know we we've seen this in the elections in England, France, and the U.S. that you know bots that are not authenticated. Or bots that are just kind of, you know, like free range bots, maybe we should call them, that, that they can actually do some real political damage as a result. Uh, not just damage to a brand, but also damage to a country. Um, and so, you know, AI needs to be made accountable in, in short. And blockchain is, blockchain is a great way to do that. Um, it gives us visibility, um, not only to what transactions are happening, um, but also it provides this, um, this layer of, provenance of the data, who owned the data, where did that data come from, and how valuable is it? So blockchain allows us to solve a bunch of things, you know, that we see AI kind of causing problems with. Well, at the very least, if it was a requirement, and it sounds like it should be that any, you know, that all bots of a certain sophistication be registered and all their activity be, you know, disclosed on a, on a public blockchain, even if it's encrypted, at least then we'd be able to see what, what the bots are doing. In order to perform, yeah. I just wonder if it's fast enough in order for them to perform actions that they would have to get permission first and validate themselves every time before they perform an action, or if they would just, we would just keep a passive record, but it would check it every once in a while to make sure there's nothing malicious. Well, you know, I think that we can't overlook the importance of people in these equations. I mean, we can't automate everything, and you know, the calculator and the computer once upon a time were desk jobs, and and you know, those things get automated. People still have to work, you know, today as a CPA, but the CPA will be automated too in future. And I guess I look at the world as being increasingly dominated by AI, and and in particular by AI monopolies. Um, you know, the, the the user data that these systems are built on at Facebook and Google is our data. It came from us. We provided that value. But those companies and and those large monopolies are then the ones that are actually gaining all of the the money from that. And so they're, they're gathering all this data. They're not sharing the money that's that's coming from that value. And Web 3.0 is supposed to be this new dawn for a fair internet. But unless we can enable a fair AI system through democratization of these 
infrastructures, then we're going to just end up living in a world of monopolistic players and our daily decisions will be affected by them. So we've got to figure out a way to kind of take that back and 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 try to avoid some of those uh, some of those monopolies from occurring. Right? Yeah. So the the internet, you know, like we talked about offline, it started out as a wish to be a you know a place where anyone could do anything, say anything, you know, earn money, et cetera, and it's it's come under control. And with the advent of AI, it could really be used in ways that the the average person doesn't want it to be used. I guess it's that old trade-off of, hey, we'll give you some free stuff, but in return, we want your data, and we're going to do a whole bunch of things that uh, will make us money on it, and we'll use it to uh, manipulate you how we want and get you to do stuff. Yeah, yeah, and that's the kind of thing that, you know, I mean, we really need to avoid, because the AI is only as valuable as it is. Based on that comes from us, that's why Facebook and Google have the most powerful AI systems on the planet. And there's a concern, though, because in 2015, Facebook released some interesting research they had done in which they were showing happy images and happy text to groups of end users. And those users began to then uh, post happy images and happy text in response. And they tried it also with sad text and sad images. And so Facebook knows how you feel and it knows how to change the way you feel. And insofar as these AI systems now having deeper and deeper control over the decisions we make, we need to make sure that we really address these two main emerging problems with AI, which are trust and user data. So we see the only logical solution is being to build an open source economy around that that's an equitable market um, for both both parties. Uh, we don't need to exclude the large corporations. You know, our goal isn't to generate a revolution, but it is like the web in many ways because what we have to do is make sure that the access to these tools is provided publicly. And we need to make sure that AI doesn't become something that is just out of reach and kind of like the clouds, something that people can't really participate in. Uh, if you have control of that tool, and you have more control over your life and, and the way that you can make a living and make your decisions. And so our goal ultimately is to provide people those tools. You know, I mean, for you with your, your podcast, your engineering background, you know, I'm sure you see the value of that also, right? It's like you, you've been able to all your life be able to handle those tools and, and contribute value as a result of it, right? Well, being in control is a couple of things. One is even knowing that AI is being used to make decisions for you, let's say, or to affect what you're doing. Then there's another level of where you could use your own AI, you know, maybe edge computing on your smartphone where you could use AIs for various tasks you want. And then I guess there's another stage where you can, like you said, have a, a series of off the shelf bots that you can maybe quickly program or customize to use for you. So there's many, many different levels of how we'll interact with AI that we really need to know and understand and control. It's not just one. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I mean, I think of it a lot, you know, just in general, it's it's software, right? I mean, this is the stuff that we build, that we use. And, you know, uh, seed, seed token is about really the the measurement of value, the atomic measurement of value within a bot marketplace. So think of it like the app store. You go into the app store and you can say, okay, here's an app that's got five stars and there's 1,000 reviews. And so you're more likely, or at least I am, to buy that app because it's gotten that backing of those previous users. So we'll see bots that are like that. And we'll all have bots. I think in 10 to 15 years, we're gonna all have bots just like we all have web pages now. They will represent us. They will make, in many cases, decisions for us. Um, and so we need to give people a means by which they can find those bots that are useful and trusted. But we also need to make sure that developers, and you know, we have about 15,000 developers that have joined us so far, um, that developers and all the different bot communities that are out there also have access to tools, not, not necessarily to change the tools we've been using, but to allow us to integrate those systems. So that let's say that I'm a natural language processing expert and I want to work with somebody that's really good at avoiding the uncanny valley. So I have to find somebody else who can build an avatar. So in that marketplace, you, you'll be able to not, we currently are, Developing this and, and uh, you know, open to help uh, at seedtoken.io. Come join us. You can sign up there. We're building out the space in which you can not only rate and buy bots, but then you can also do the same with the, the component parts. 
all the way down to the deepest level of you know entries within the library. So the, the access to the tools has to do with providing really simple top level access like at the App Store, but then also really being able to work with community developers that are, are working almost kind of at like a, a Linux kernel level. <clears throat> Makes sense? Yeah, I understand. So what are, what are some of the first bots that are going to be there in the store, for lack of a better word, or abilities yeah. to customize? Um, so there's uh, right now, if I look at the work that we've done over the last uh, 10 years or so, we've seen that there are five primary categories. There's uh, health and wellness. A lot of bots have already been built and will continue to be built there. Uh, customer relations and help desk stuff. We're going to see financial, uh, mobile, um, uh, sorry, mobility. Uh, so that basically you can talk with the car and uh, it'll talk back. Uh, think about like a show for. Um, and then, of course, education. And education is the one that I like the most. Uh, and in a way, all of these are different uh, verticals that represent education in a way. What you're doing whenever you build one of these systems is you're basically allowing people to understand the value of a product and how best to interact with it. And then there's education around a particular task. So if it's managing their health, it's educating people on how to take care of their body, educating people on how to take care of their money, um, how, where and how to drive, things like that. So in, in some instances, you know, one, one that I'm interested in seeing develop sooner rather than later is language learning. Um, because I think that we have the opportunity, if we think of a bot as being kind of like a prism, and there's two social groups on either side of it, people that have the knowledge and people that want to learn the knowledge, and the bot is there to sort of broker that, um, I think language learning is going to be a really big use case because there are a lot of people that can provide data for that bot in terms of what the words are and how to say them. Uh, there's also an interesting part about language, which is that it's not just words and sounds, but it's also very visual in terms of reading and writing. Um, are you able to read? Um, and that's something that an avatar is really is really good at helping with. Um, we also, though, have seen, um, we've received requests to build essentially portraits of people, um, uh, some famous folks in the Middle East, uh, for those Westerners listening, think of it something kind of like an Abraham Lincoln. Um, and that's a project that we're just starting now. And then we've also built bots for helping kids at Monash University managing their mental health. Uh, here again, they just want someone to talk to and say, oh, I hate my parents and not feel like they're being judged. So there's a range of different use cases. Um, almost anywhere we see one person talking to another person, remotely is, is a potential use case for this. So it's, it, from my seat, it looks like we're moving into a new era of conversational interface. And it looks to me to be much bigger than, um, than the web because we'll be talking to all these devices all around us. Lots and lots and lots of use cases. Well, <laughs> since you're in the industry, what's possible and what's fantasy right now? And how will that change over the next two years? Yeah, um, so possible right now is to measure with a very high level of precision how a person is feeling emotionally and why, and to predict what they will be doing with a 90% accuracy. So just it, within the voice alone, there's over 200 vectors of data. You can tell probably my gender and my age and where I grew up as three example vectors in my voice. Uh, there's also systems, you know, such as Microsoft Cognitive Services and others that we've worked with that, that really um, allow you to identify, is this person drunk? And the longer a person speaks with that particular system, the higher level of precision it has for determining things like that. There's, those outlier value sets of you know, if someone's drunk or not. So the reality is that the Amazon Alexa is currently collecting a lot of valuable information about how we feel and building predictive models about what we will be doing. And we're not always aware of that. Um, and the other reality of the industry is um, that we see so many different systems that are beginning to use conversational interfaces um, that I think it's going to quickly become just uh, uh, automatic that it'll be there. Um, now, the science fiction of it, let's look maybe six months out. Will people be falling in love with these systems? Well, that's already happened, and people have gotten married with bots, and, and yes, people have fallen in love with them since, like, really, Eliza uh, back in the 80s, developed by Joseph Weizenbaum. 
um, will people begin in like a year to two years to begin to talk with them more than with other people? Um, that I think is something that science fiction. Uh, and I think it's a couple of years away still. I noticed for myself, I spent a lot of time in Second Life for a few years. And when I was spending more than eight hours a day, or like more than half of my waking time in Second Life, I realized I'd kind of crossed a boundary line. I, I, I was spending more time in that sure. virtual reality. And, and I think that we'll see moments when people will begin to find that they're more comfortable talking with bots than they are talking with other people. For the same reason that some people spend more time in video games than they do in the real world. They get more of what they like from that interaction um, than they might in the physical world. The, you know, now artificial general intelligence, this is a very abstract term that includes common sense reasoning. And I think that's something that's further out than a couple of years away. Um, but again, yeah, I just, very I just meant specifically with uh, with bots, though, you know, like what what's the fantasy and what's the reality of bots? But uh, yeah. you know, I think you explained that AGI. Yeah, who knows? That could be many years away, or never, or who knows? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and I mean, I have a hard time even like just defining artificial intelligence. I mean, I really like to look at these things as essentially uh, orchestrated twitches. You know, we have <laughs> how do we get lots of twitches to all kind of occur in the appropriately orchestrated way so that we have something that makes sense to a person. Um, you know, what, what do you see as science fiction in front of us? I'm curious to know, like, within, like, a, a say, four to five year period, what do you think would be science fiction? I like how you turn all this around on me, but that's cool. Um, <laughs> right now, what I see is AIs are super narrow. And in order to get any performance, you have to string together a whole, you know, a, a group or a bunch of AIs to really make any kind of uh, anything like super useful. Um, I, I just, I guess it's more worry as it comes to AI. I worry, like you said, you know, people would just get sucked into, uh, you know, second life type things. Like, you know, I just saw Ready Player One a few months ago, you know, and in the movie, I don't know if yeah. listeners have seen it. It's a really good movie, good book, but, you know, some people spend their whole lives in this virtual reality, which I see happening, but then again, I don't. Um, I see people spending a lot of time with their devices and all that, but there's still the pull of, of reality. But yeah, there'll be groups of people that you never see and they're just bots control everything about what they do. And then there's ones that'll just be, you know, kind of a mixture of it. And then there'll be like the naturalists that reject all that stuff. And yeah. I think that'll happen no matter what happens to AI. So I yeah. see those three groups. Um, yeah. I, I, I like to divide the world not into f real reality and virtual reality, but into virtual reality and physical reality. And, you know, for myself, I, I've been in, involved in VR, as I mentioned, since the 90s, and, and I love it. And I still, I see a lot of our work at both Seed and Botanica being about building essentially virtual reality characters. And, and we've deployed in virtual reality and augmented reality prototypes as well. Um, but I, I think that if, if we look at language or money, I mean, certainly blockchain is a kind of virtual reality. But that doesn't mean that it's unreal. It doesn't mean that it doesn't have a, a real impact on our lives. And there was, there's certainly going to be Luddites that they, they're not going to want to come anywhere close to a bot or any kind of AI system, just like there are people that don't want to use phones. And, and we're going to see a lot of different, a lot of different ways in which people are, are interoperating. But for me, the key is, back to this question of trust. In order to trust it, you have to know that what it is, that it's a bot. And if we don't build in systems of trust, um, I think we've got a, a, big, a big problem. An open source, there's this funny story I want to tell you about uh, a Linux kernel. Uh, it was actually a semicolon in a Linux kernel. And um, that somebody went in and uh, they changed the semicolon to a colon. And what it did is it opened up a security vulnerability uh, within the Linux kernel. And the Linux community saw that some anonymous user had changed it. So they changed it back to a semicolon. But then what happened was that like two weeks later, this anonymous person or persons changed it back to a colon. And the Linux community said, wait, 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 that's not right. That's not how we want it. We can't trust this system that that thing is there. So they set up a cron job. So whenever that semicolon was changed, they were notified. And what that hmm. does is it builds an economy, as we see with Linux, it builds an open source economy that people can trust. And so we need to do the same thing with bots and with AI so that when we talk to them, whether we're a Luddite or somebody that is just full-fledged, you know, 24-7 talking with these things, that you know what it is and you know that you can trust it. Um, and yeah. I think that, you know, 
that that to me is something that is uh, an absolute necessity for us as as developers to be able to trust these things. What, what's an example of like a, an untrusted AI? What would be one of the concerns that you would have there? <laughs> Just to keep turning this around a bit. No, I mean it's a tremendous issue. You can have bots that. Uh, I, I mean, the bot could emulate anyone you know. It could contact you over Skype or other methods and give you false messages. I mean, you know, to give you like a real innocuous example that shows me this is sometimes, you know, like I have a wife and kids. Sometimes my kids will text me on my wife's phone. And now we tell them, always say, hey, this is so-and-so. It's not mama, you know. Right, but right. there's been times where I got a text and I knew, okay, you know, my, my wife wouldn't say that. But there's been times where I wasn't so sure and I re I responded and all that and and my daughter would be like, oh, no, it was me. It wasn't Mama. And I said, don't do that, you know. And that's, that's simple. <laughs> but imagine, right, if, uh, if if Vox would become intelligent enough to communicate with people. I mean, it could fool them 10 ways from Sunday easily. It could cause all kinds of problems. I mean, it could anger people to cause them to fight with others. Um, you know, the provocation was all false. I mean, it could it could put people in jail. I mean, it could do all kinds of things. It could, I mean, really, there are terrible consequences, I think, so. It, yeah. it is super important to vet these things. You know, like GPS, uh, the GPS can be hacked and you go to a place where you're not supposed to go and then someone takes you. I mean, just anything, anything is possible. The, the amount of deception is unbelievable. Yeah. There's this crazy thing we saw coming out of Adobe last year called Voco. Uh, I don't know if it's still under the same name now, but it's worth looking up. And it basically takes a sample of a person's voice over whatever, like a couple of minutes. And then mm -hmm. you can restructure the phonemes of the words into new words. And so right. basically what that means is that, you know, after this recording, I can go back and I can take your voice, Rich, and I can go into Voco and I could make that system say things in the way that you would say them yourself. And that's, that's really weird because suddenly it means that when we're talking with a system and it says, you know, this call is being recorded for quality assurance purposes, well, if my voice is being recorded and then that voice pattern is being able to be used by bots for mm. these kinds of duplicitous purposes you're talking about, then suddenly, you know, my wife or my kids, just to use your example, wouldn't know that I was calling and asking them to go and like leave the house and go to this particular place with this particular thing at, at a particular right. time. That duplicitous behavior is the very reason why we think license plates are so important for these things. And what we want to do is make this open enough so that anybody can contribute to it and that there is a peer review system and a rating of the components such that we all know, okay, we can trust it. Just like with Linux, we can all say, this is a valid bot. It's got a valid reputation. It's got a valid license plate and it's an internationally acknowledged standard that we all have contributed to. So it's not just that we're providing the tools, we're also providing the means to evaluate the, the trustworthiness of these systems. Because um, if we're going to be living in a world where they are next to us and helping us make choices, uh, and we have family or friends, as most of us do, uh, yeah, yep. we've got we got to make sure we address that stuff. Yeah. Well, you just made me realize another level. You know, Facebook or you know whatever company, like you said, records calls. If it grabs your voice. If it grabs, um, I mean, it can grab all kinds of biometrics. It can grab all kinds of information. And with the power of bots now and what's coming, I mean, it could emulate you as much as it wanted to. It could really wreak havoc. You know, let's say if, yeah. um, if Facebook was just hacked, what, what happens when there's biometric and voice and all kinds of other data that hackers can get access to? Forget about birth date and social, but all this other stuff yeah. that cannot be recreated. What do you do then? Right. I mean, this is exactly why I say that, you know, one of those top three problems we see artificial intelligence presenting is the management of our use for data and identity. Um, you know, we see with Cambridge Analytica, oh, holy cow, they got a lot of information about a lot of people. And that's just from people putting text and images into web pages. That's not about the kind of multimodal interaction that we're looking at. I mean, these are highly surveillance systems. And over the years, as we've been developing them, we're realizing more and more that that surveillance in some cases is great, you know, if it's a hospital yeah. or a helicopter parent, but hospitals and helicopter parents generally have the same surveillance policies that dictator states do. And so we're right, saying, okay, right. let's just address this. 
and make sure that people not only uh, have the ability to control their data within like a GDPR kind of privacy sphere, but what we've also come across, and this is where the blockchain gets interesting again, is that we can now provide users with the ability to be compensated for their end user data. And, and mm. Facebook doesn't do that. But what we can do now is we can say, okay, you've provided a lot of information about this particular prescription, or you provided information about uh, you know, a market trend. And that when that data is used, now this is not implemented. This is what we're working towards in the coming 18 months. When that right. end user data is then used and monetized, then as the provider of that data, you get paid for it. So, I mean, like, I heard that you know, face, a Facebook account is worth something like, on average, like 150 bucks a month. I've heard it's like fractions of a penny, and I've heard thousands of dollars per month. But whatever that amount is, we believe that end users should be compensated for that while simultaneously gotcha. being able to preserve their own identity. So blockchain is yep. really cool here because that transparent ledger, if people have said to me, like, why do you need to put a bot on blockchain? Like a blockchain bot for me is very much like a, a CPA. It's a certified public accountant. And as bots are just managing the transactions between whether it's an API service or the transfer between a, a buyer and a seller, that accounting mechanism has to be publicly certified and blockchain provides it. Right, right. So now we can say, all right, great. So this bot now is like you're just collecting your end user data and you can get paid for that. You as a developer have contributed something, you can get paid for that. And it's, it's not a free model in the way that Wikipedia is, but it is like Wikipedia in that there is a dialogue of curation and a dialogue of content and, you know, at the end of the day, Seed Token is basically about compensating people for the content they've contributed. You know, that, that's an equitable well, exchange of data. Well, very good. Well, Mark, with the, um, with the top of the hour, so we're out of time. I, I really enjoyed talking to you. It's been great. Uh, can, you give, can you give a resource for listeners? How do they find out more? How do they connect with you and find out about Seed and Botanic? Yeah, thank you. Uh, seedtoken.io. Uh, seedtoken.io. One more time for your listeners, seedtoken.io's the website. Um, that's that's where uh, we're really we have uh, about 700 partner companies that have signed up, and um, you know developers uh, are welcome there as well. Uh, we're on Telegram and Discord and Twitter, um, and then uh, Botanic.io, just one of the partner companies, along with uh, Fetch Ocean. Uh, bot chain. There's a number of other companies uh, that are bot developers that are all parts of that partner ecosystem now. Um, and Very so good. Seed Token is where you want to go. And uh, you know, I'm Mark at SeedToken.io or Mark at Botanic.io. So uh, thank you very much, Rich. Really appreciate taking time. You have been listening to Almost Here, around the corner of future technology podcast with Richard Jacobs. Subscribe to this podcast both to review to discover more future technologies that are poised to transform our lives for better or worse, such as Bitcoin, artificial intelligence, 3D printing, blockchain, virtual reality, and more.